it is my pleasure to introduce F.T. Lukens, an award-winning author of young adult fiction, F.T.'s urban fantasy novel, The Rules and Regulations for Mediating Myths and Magic, won several awards, including the 2017 Forward Indies Gold Award for Young Adult Fiction. It's a really great book. You should totally check it out. Um, <clears throat> the 2017 IPA, IPBA Benjamin Franklin Gold Award for Best Teen Fiction, the 2017 Bisexual Book Award for Speculative Fiction, and it was also recently named to the 2019 ALA Rainbow Book List. FT holds a degree in psychology and English literature and has a love of cheesy television shows. Yes, we have talked about Buffy before, superhero movies, and writing. Um, and writing. FT lives in North Carolina with their spouse, three kids, three dogs, and three cats. And it is my pleasure to give them the floor. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Malaprops, for uh, having us join virtually. I am here with uh, five amazing authors to talk about short stuff, LGBTQ plus YA anthology featuring fun romances. There's four great short stories in here. Um, and our friend, Julian Winters, who is the author of Running with Lions and the upcoming uh, Summer of Everything, wrote a little blurb. He says, short stuff is a big breath of fresh air filled with stories exploring friendships, family, courage, and swoon-worthy romances. This collection has something for all readers. From start to finish, it's a vibrant reminder that everyone deserves a happy ending. So we're going to talk about this book and meet the authors. We are joined by Jude Sierra. Please wave. Hi. There you go, Jude. Uh, Kate Fierro. Hey. Julia Ember, Tom Walensky, Tom Wave, <laughs> <laughs> Tom Rose, I feel like and, I'm tonight, <laughs> and Jen Sternick. Hi, hi. So, um, my first question for our lovely authors is to have you guys introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourselves, where you're joining us from. Um, because I know you're not all in Asheville. <laughs> and uh, tell us a little bit about your contribution to the anthology. Who would like to start? Jude? Jude, oh. you start. <laughs> I, okay. Um, that was a lot of stuff all at once. So hi, I'm Jude Sierra. I'm from the greater Detroit area, like the metro Detroit area. Um, I both write in the um, contemporary romance, um, contemporary queer romance um, sector area, and I'm starting in YA. I'm also working on my PhD in rhetoric in writing, and I look at like the intersections of queer, feminist, pop culture studies. Um, so I like to do like kind of dorky stuff on the side, but it's I think it's exciting. And um, I wrote the August Sands, which is kind of a coming of age story. It's featuring kind of the meet cute of first love, first meeting a boy on the beach kind of thing, and also those moments between high school and college when you're kind of figuring yourself out. It's Hopefully a very cute, very cute summary vacation romance um, with a great kind of vacation guys next door uh, yes. vibe. Yeah. Yeah, and it definitely was kind of like my, I, I love Michigan, so my little like love letter to a certain area of Michigan that I'm very familiar with, so. Um, Kate, you want to tell us about uh, where you're calling from and what your contribution about your short story? Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm basically calling from the other side of the world because I'm here in Europe, in, in Poland, um, where it's midnight right now, so it's a bit dark outside. <laughs> um, uh, I am an editor, translator, proofreader, and teacher of English. And uh, for the last seven years, I've, I'm, I've, been, I've also been a writer. And um, I'm bilingual. I don't write in my native language, which uh, for me works fine. Uh, and my story is Love in the Time of Coffee, which is um, a series of tiny little uh, glimpses of two best friends as their friendship develops into something more. Uh, and each of those glimpses is flavored with, with coffee, basically, which uh, each scene uh, happens with coffee in the background. 
uh, and it's uh, basically a very short story um, based on my, my favorite trope of um, friends to lovers. So. I love the way you, you said that, that it was flavored with the coffee throughout <laughs> and you have the little headings of the different coffees for their different stages of the relationship. It's very, I really enjoyed that part of it. It was a lot of fun writing that. Um, okay, and there's Tom. Um, so Jen and Tom, do you want to tell us, you guys are co-writers of um, uh, I Ate the Whole World to Find You. If you want to tell us a little bit, well, first where you're joining us from and a little bit about the story. I'm joining you from the Catskills in New York State, where we just got an emergency broadcast warning telling us that we're having um, hail, thunderstorms, and we should move to an interior room, which I don't have because I'm in a small shack. That's why I blinked off. Um, Jen? I'm from Rhode Island, where we're having lovely sunny weather and there are, there are no issues. <laughs> Tom, do you want to tell them a little bit about the story? Sure. Um, our story is called, I Ate the Whole World to Find You. That's from a, a, a Greek phrase that we found in researching uh, one of the main characters. Basil is a uh, Greek American Olympic swimming hopeful and um, Will is the, the high school kid who uh, runs the snack bar at the pool club. Um, it's a meet cute like all of the stories and um, Basil is intense and involved in his practice uh, Will is involved in his culinary arts um, and pleasing people through that and through a snafu involving the herb basil, not the swimmer, they start out with conflict and proceed to other things. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's a very cute meat cute, also kind of a meat disaster. Um, the way fine. they, they uh, start off a little bit of a misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> but a very cute story, um, and I really liked the way that you guys used um, Will's food uh, throughout. Um, that was really neat, and, and the alternating point of view. And then the last story is by Julia Ember, um, Gilded Scales. So Julia, where are you joining us from? And then tell us a little bit about your story. I'm joining you from Seattle. Um, I'm kind of a recent transplant to Seattle. I recently moved from the UK back to the US um, just in time for coronavirus. Um, I am a YA author. Um, I'm the author of the Seafarer's Kiss duology from Interlude as well as Brunzong, which is coming out later this year. Um, my story is Gilded Scales, which is kind of the odd man out. It's the only fantasy story um, in the collection um, and it's a loose retelling of Beowulf um, and it's about a dragon hunter who falls in love with a dragon shifter. Um, so kind of an odd meet cute, but they, they fall in love atop a pile of gold, um, as one does. <laughs> yes, it was the only, it's the only fantasy in, among the four stories, but it is, and it's very different um, than the other four, but it was, it was really awesome. So right now in YA, um, anthologies are a pretty hot thing. Um, we've seen a recent Poe anthology um, come out with, with Dahlia Adler editing, um, and there's some announcements of some anthologies that are coming out. So one of my questions for y'all is, um, what drew you to writing for this anthology, um, writing for the Meet Cutes, and how was it pitched to you, and when it was, did you automatically have an idea, or did it take you a minute to come up with something? And I'll pick on uh, go ahead, Jen. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, um, the meet, the anthology was pitched to us um, by Interlude as a, they wanted it to be everything to be light and low angst and um, fun, and they didn't want a lot of heavy, heavy stories with heavy storylines and. It just so happened at the time that Tom and I were talking about a chapter from another book that we were working on that we had to cut. And we were, I wanted to do something with this chapter and the chapter had to do with two boys starting to get to know each other and having a lot of miscommunication because they just used language differently. They 
they didn't speak each other's language very well, even though they were both English speakers, but they just, one was an, uh, was an athlete and the other was not at all. And so we took that and we started playing with the idea of um, how could you put these two in a position where they really don't understand each other. And so we created Basil the swimmer and we created Will the chef who cooks with Basil and that created a, a world for us where they're both very competitive and both very um, focused on what they do and they use the same words but in very, very different ways. And so we just wanted to really have fun with that kind of misunderstanding about using the same words in different ways. All right, who else wants to jump in? Why, what drew you to writing in this anthology? Um, I guess I really wanted to try writing something that was lighter and fluffier. So my novels are quite dark. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're all pretty dark, pretty um, gruesome stories, a lot of them. And I wanted to try writing something that was not that. And so when Interlude kind of pitched me on the idea, I was kind of like, for, at first I was like, can I even do this? And then I thought, yes, I can. Um, and I really wanted to write a Beowulf retelling. Um, so those two things kind of came together and I just decided to give it a go, not knowing if the end product um, would, would really work out because I've never written a fluffy story before in my life. Um, but I ended up really liking it. So it kind of went from there. I think kind of on the same vein, um, I'll say as Julia, I tend to write fiction that I wouldn't say is dark, but has um, heavier themes about like healing and regrowth. And I really wanted to try my hand at YA. This seemed like a good kind of entry point. I wanted to try my hand at writing short stories. And I really wanted to write something that felt good that also represented like this coming of age thing that I love in YA that I think is really exciting to write about. So um, I don't actually remember being pitched because that was right around the time when I had my concussion, I think. So I don't remember quite how it happened, but I'm excited that it did. Uh, for me, it was similar as well. I mean, uh, I usually write, write maybe not darker stuff, but more dramatic and more, more angsty stuff. Um, but uh, this story was actually written before uh, I saw uh, information about this anthology. Uh, it was written as an exercise basically because I uh, I always thought I can't write short stuff and I can't, can't write light stuff. So uh, it was kind of a challenge for me. Uh, one day I just decided to try. I took some um, themes, some, some ideas that felt good and, and just wrote it and then it sat in the drawer for a year. And when I, when I saw information about this anthology, I just thought, okay, maybe this would be good. So I, I, I took it out, I re uh, rewrote some things, edit, ed edited it and sent it, and the rest is history. So one of the things that you all kind of touched on when you were talking about participating in the anthology is, is writing a short story. Um, and first off, y'all did amazing at it. And also I loved all of your characters. Um, that's something that as a writer, um, I struggle with is short form. And also with making sure that characterization happens, you know, in that short form. So how different was it writing a short story and making sure that you guys had well-rounded characters and conflict and, you know, and, and getting that all in, in a shortened form. Was it difficult? Was it, you know, have you written short in the past? Was this your first one? Elaborate a little bit on what your writing processes were like for this uh, anthology. I had um, practiced like a, a low stakes short story. It was the first short story I'd ever written outside of fan fiction because that's kind of where my roots are and it was for frolic and they said will you write us a cute holiday story and I said well you know why not it's it was really low stakes and I um that was my first time getting to experiment with kind of working on fleshing out characters in a short space and it is really really challenging for me but it's fun it's exciting to get to play in a, a new kind of medium and feel like you're stretching your wings by writing a story in a smaller space so um I'd be excited to try it again. I don't know that I'm like 
super confident about it yet, but it was fun. Jen and I love writing from prompts. And we started writing at each other be, before we uh, before we started writing together. And we would write um, one to two page pieces on a day, a trip, something aggravating a relative did. Um, and this felt like sort of a natural extension of that, although nobody in the story is as gruesome as any relative of mine. But it was Jen's idea for both characters. Um, and we chose our respective ones. I chose Will, Jen chose Basil. And we had a lot of fun um, throwing it back and forth and knowing that we had only a little bit of time to explain and present each character. Yeah, we made a, we made a big list of um, terms that you could use in both swimming and cooking. So um, heat, basil, um, kick, flip, uh, turn, all kinds of things that we made all these like vocabulary lists that you could use one way or the other, depending on whether you're talking about swimming or cooking. And, and then we just started to try to work them in as much as we could. <laughs> uh, I must say that for me, it was very difficult to write a short story. Mm, I'm basically known among you know, people who, who, who like, who know my writing uh, for never being able to write a short story because my characters tend to take on life on, 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 of their own. And uh, the, the, the more I, I write, the more they want me to tell about them. So this was definitely a challenge. And I think the only thing that helped was the, the, the uh, form of, of very short glimpses, of very short scenes, because if it was just continuous story, I would probably have much bigger problem keeping it short. I think the fact that Gilded Scales was a retelling kind of helped me to keep it short, because um, I don't, if anyone doesn't know the story of Beowulf, it's basically a monster hunter has to fight like three monsters in the story for glory. And it, when I had the idea, I was like, okay, well, in the format of a short story, I can definitely only have there be one monster. So right away, I had like taken away like two thirds of the original short source material before I even went into it. Um, but writing a fantasy um, that short was really hard um, to try and get any kind of sense of world building, um, even like escalating stakes. Like I find that really challenging in short form. Um, I think having it be a mute cute made that a little bit easier um, because I could use some romantic tropes. Like there's a little bit of a play on the, like there's only one bed trope in the short story. Um, and so I was able to use certain tropes to help me make it shorter, but still fantasy at that length is really hard. I have so much more respect for people who write for um, like fantasy and science fiction magazines full time. It's a really hard format. Can, can I just volunteer? Um that having read uh, FTE Starhost series, I'm sure you could write a short story. The elegant spare style on that, yes, you can. You don't have to, but you could. I have it. to point out, it took me three books to tell that whole story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Olive Kittredge, interlinked stories. I mean, it, three of these suckers. <laughs> to tell one story. <laughs> so um, I, I actually was really impressed how all three, how all four stories um, were able to tell a succinct, meet cute, romance, fun story in that little bit of time. Um, and Kate, what you were saying about just having that inherent structure to yours, I could really see how that was, you know, how their relationship grew over the course of their lives together because you used a scene from when they're little to a scene when they're teenager or like middle school and then like teenagers and went on. Um, so for me to be able to do that, Tom, I would have to have something like that, some hard structure to fit it in to be able to do something that small. <laughs> um, I just have confidence that you could do it if you wanted. Props to y'all for taking it on and doing it. <laughs> um, so meet cutes uh, and romance tropes. Um, my favorite meet cute recently um, was from Schitt's Creek um, when David and Patrick met. 
um, when David had to get the uh, business license and met Patrick and then that had that disaster phone call where he left all those really weird voicemails. Um, that's probably my favorite meet cute right now. Um, for what are your favorite meet cutes in media? What's your favorite trope? Have you seen any media do it really well recently or anybody do it really badly? Um, and did you use your favorite tropes in the story that you wrote? So my all time favorite trope is enemies to lovers, which is like kind of at odds in some ways with the meet cute theme. Um, but I still wanted to use that in Gilded Scales. Um, I wouldn't say that my two girls are enemies per se. They think that they are, but it's only because they've never met. Um, but yeah, enemies to lovers is what I gravitate to the most um, out of any story. Recent meet cutes, I mean, we just got Disney Plus so that we could watch Hamilton. And then I watched Frozen and I became obsessed with it. So I have to say, like, I did love the meet cute of like meeting in a little Nordic shop up in the mountains while trying to rescue your sister. <laughs> I thought that was adorable. So. Not not meeting um, two sisters in revolutionary New York. Yeah, that's good too. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I think one of my favorites is more of a trope, but kind of a soulmates thing. And I get really excited when I see people do it with a uh, kind of a spin. I've always really wanted to, to try and do that, to take um, this kind of traditional, we have to be thrown together. It's like, you know, we have to share a bed only on a cosmic scale. Um, so I really like that. And I'm always like thirsty for more. So if people have it and have recommendations, please throw them my way. I have spent the pandemic watching things that make me cry for some reason. So I have no current meet cutes. I'm just processing feelings through media. <laughs> I agree with, uh, with Jude that, yeah, the, the soulmates trope is really, really um, something that has always kind of struck a chord with me, but I can't really imagine myself writing it. I don't know why. Um, and with, uh, with this, uh, story, I, I wrote the Friends to Lovers trope, which is also, um, something I, I really enjoy. Um, uh, and there's one more, which is not really a mute, meet cute. There's, um, second chances or reunions, which can't really be, be called meet cute because it's usually after years, but, uh, yeah, I think this is, this is next on my list. I think Tom and I are very drawn to um, enemies to lovers and opposites attract because there's a two voice. You, we, we really like to do two distinctive voices and, and that sort of draws itself to that. Um, but I'm determined someday we're gonna do there was only one bed. I just haven't figured out how we're gonna do it yet. <laughs> With dragons, obviously. <laughs> Those are some of my favorite. There's there's only one bed. Like any form you can give that to me, I'm there. <laughs> um, and trapped together, soulmates, enemies to love. I love them all, um, all of them. And a lot of them show up in what I write. Um, but uh, I think for, if I remember correctly, because it's been so long, um, in Star Host Broken Moon Trilogy, um, it's that trapped together. They are trapped together for a long time. Um, and that's kind of the, the romance trope that starts their meet cute, not really a meet cute, but <laughs> that's, it starts their, their romantic journey. Um, well, they also kind of have an enemies to lovers. I am, okay, sorry, I'm going to fangirl over your books. <laughs> I'm like number one fan of these books. So. <laughs> uh, yes, you are. <laughs> uh, I love you, dude. Um, so, uh, it, Audience, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, so that we can ask our lovely authors um, and have them answer your questions about writing, short stories, anthologies, um, queer media, anything like that. Um, so what, so in this, of course, is an LGBTQ anthology. So all four stories um, have queer characters. Um, what do you think, or, or how did you approach writing? Um, how did you feel writing like a, a queer happy ever after?
I would, uh, mine's a little hard because mine's kind of a, it ends on a, not, I wouldn't say bittersweet, but it's kind of like Tommy has had his first kiss and his first um, kind of relationship, but it's a summer vacation. So it's almost like a summer fling, but I wanted it to feel like that coming of age that's really happy. And at no point is his sexuality or Chase's sexuality an issue. It's like, this is just who they are. And I really love seeing that and reading that in books where we don't have to like kind of delve into a backstory, which I love reading in books too, but I kind of just wanted the story to focus elsewhere and to um, have it be about Tommy's next step as he, as he moves forward. So I wanted it to be like cute and light and to leave people with like that happy feeling of, um, what it's like when we step into the great unknown in a good way. Yeah, I also wouldn't say that Gilded Scales has a happy ever after ending per se. Um, it's a very hopeful ending, um, but it's also a little bit open. And I think when I was writing the romance, I wanted it to be that way because it was a short format story. And I just didn't think like given the format that there was enough time for the two to have like really solidified their romance to the extent they would say it's like happy ever after forever. Um, so it's much more of like a hopeful, happy for now ending. I, Jen I think and I think it's, Jen and I thought, oh, I'm sorry, Kate. No, no. Well, we think that happy endings are really important for, for queer stories um, because you know, there aren't that many queer stories out there. And for writing YA, we want to instill hope after, you know, enemies to lovers or miscommunication or that little bit of angst that we may put in. So we were all on board with that. Yeah, I, I agree with Tom. And uh, I think it's very important in my, in my head, uh, all my stories have happy endings. Uh, I, uh, which is either, you know, happy ever after or at least happy for now. Um, and um, I think it, yeah, the, the, that sense of hope of, of uh, light uh, is something that is just important, uh, I think, to everyone, but, but to uh, the queer teenagers, especially kids, teenagers who may not feel confident in this, uh, yeah, in, in their life, in their, uh, yeah. Which is why I'm so thankful um, for this anthology and for um, anthologies like this and for also the, your other works that y'all have written um, about, especially for YA, that they're hopeful, um, hopeful endings, um, happy for nows, happy ever afters, um, for those younger readers to see that, um, that you know, being queer or, or um, you know, questioning and, and having that growth um, through your teenagehood that you can also, um, you know, find your happy for now, your happy ever after. Um, and it's important that we have those stories for those young readers. Um, we do have a question and it is uh, Kate, for Kate, um, can you talk a bit more about writing in more than one language? Um, it's funny actually because I I don't write in in my native language. Uh, I work as an editor at, as proofreader translator, uh, all that in my native language and English both. But um, I I don't know why I can't write fiction in my my native language. I tried uh, and I tried reading something that someone translated into my native language, not knowing that it is my native language, and it felt very very weird. Um, and um, because I've worked with language all my life, basically. Um, this is something for me, this is something to do with the melody of language, with the uh, uh, specifics. And I think my, my native language, which is Polish and uh, English are very, very different, both in vocabulary and in, in melody, in rhythm. Um, and I just can't imagine writing in my own, which is, which is, I think, a bit of a pity because, uh, for example, if I would like to make an, uh, organize an, uh, some kind of um, author's read, uh, uh, meeting or, you know, just, just talk about um, my writing, my, uh, my books, not, not just my books, but in general, in queer books in, uh, in my, for example, city, uh, 
it would uh, it would have to be I don't know either in English or only for people who who read in English. So. Thank you, Kate. We have a, another question um, from our audience. For all the authors, what is a trope that you haven't written yet, but you would like to? I'm punting this one to Jen because I don't really think about what I'm going to write first, and she always likes to outline. Well, I think I mentioned earlier, at some point, I'm going to make sure we do There Was Only One Bed, but. Um, Oh, we're, yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 and I, we just haven't figured that out. And I would be 100% here for that story. <laughs> um, we are tossing around uh, an idea that combines a whole lot of tropes, which is going to be secret lovers plus sexy millionaire plus uh, possibly a love triangle. And we have uh, it, it keeps coming together. So that one's going to be fun when, when we finish what we're working on now, when we get to that one. That's going to be a whole bunch of tropes all in one book. It sounds much too organized. I don't want to do it. <laughs> I think I'd really like to do either arranged marriage or marriage of convenience. Um, but I think I would want to do it in like a YA fantasy space. So I still have to work out exactly how I would do arranged marriages, but make them teenagers. Um, but yeah, I think that would be my, my one trope that I want to figure out how to do. Because I love like the kind of like fake marriage that trope that then becomes like a real love affair. So I'd love to try to do it. Julia, would you do that in the fantasy arena? Oh yeah, I would do it in fantasy. Yeah. Um, I have very few contemporary ideas. I wish I had more, but yeah. <laughs> I've always wanted to try and write something in magical realism. Um, I have something that I've been trying to work on and um, it's kind of the trope of somebody discovering that they have an ability. So, you know, it kind of mirrors that coming of age and then also trying to figure out how you navigate. I have this ability and this person doesn't. And how do we, how do we navigate that sort of thing? So I'm very much not a fantasy person. I love reading fantasy and I love reading magical realism. And then I'm way too literal, but I would love to, I'm still like slowly hacking away at trying to do it. So... Uh, I think I would like to write pretend couples one day, but I don't have any concrete idea yet. So that's going to have to percolate a little bit. Um, and two other things that I have been thinking about, maybe, you know, just having some creative process about is something to do with, uh, like Jude said, abilities, uh, some, some special abilities, but without going full into uh, fantasy. Um, that's one thing. And another, uh, which is something that I don't see enough of, I think, is polyamory. Uh, and that's definitely something that I would like to explore in queer context. We lost you there for a minute, Kate. What was that oh. last thing you said? Uh, I was saying that I would like to explore the, um, the tro uh, maybe not the trope, the, the um, theme of polyamory in, in queer, queer context, queer, queer relationships. I applaud all y'all who can write contemporary. Um, I, it's just not something that I'm able to do. I can't apparently create conflict unless there's a unicorn present or a spaceship. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I'm with Julia about sticking with tropes and putting them in a uh, fantasy, uh, or sci-fi environment. Um, I am currently trying to work on an enemies to lovers in space um, and <laughs> seeing how that's going. Um, and I think, well, it's not really a, a, a romance trope, but something I would love to do is an alternate history. Um, but that would just take, that, that was gonna, that's gonna be a really in-depth project, a lot of research, a lot of, um, you know, thinking about if I did change one aspect of history, how that would cascade. So alternate history is something I've always wanted to do and always wanted to write, um, but I know that it would, it's going to take, it's not something that I'd be able to do in, in a year. I think it's going to be something that, that would have to percolate for a long time and do a lot of research about. We have another question. Thank you for asking questions. Um, 
this <laughs> this is to everyone um besides ft and each other what are some of your favorite authors who are some of your favorite authors what are some of your favorite books i am a huge i like i read reverie um by Ryan Lasala, like shortly before I had my concussion. So it's really vivid. I loved it. I loved the, I, there's so many things I could say about how much I loved it, but I loved the playfulness of it. And I love the way that it kind of kept you guessing, but in a, in a really unique way where you really, really have no idea because the character has no idea and it got pulled off so well. And so I'm really, really excited to see what's coming next from Ryan. I, I think it's something kind of really different, but I think it's going to be really exciting because um, it just, I felt like it was really, really well written. So, um, and I am a huge fan of Julian Winters. I feel like every book that he writes and this is not just because he's my friend, but every book that he writes, it, I feel like he grows and grows and it's so exciting and d diverse in a way that feels like really natural because that's the world that we lived in, live in. And I think that Julian does that really, really well and does coming of age beautifully. So. Um, so I'm terrible at remembering everything that I've read like long-term. Um, but some recent books that I really loved. I recently read Dread Nation by Justina Ireland, which is an alternate history um, where they basically changed it so that there are zombies um, in the Civil War. And that was fantastic. Um, I think Justina, like as a writer, really her work is like a masterclass in voice because um, her characters are just so vivid in first person. Um, I also read a book called Blood Countess, which was also an alternate history because I love them. Um, which was about Elizabeth Bathory, who was like a serial killing countess um, in, I think it was, I forget which, which country it was, I think it might have been Ukraine, um, in the 15th century, and that was fantastic too. And it was a YA book, but it was really dark, um, and just really lush prose, and I, I loved it. I just read The Water Bearer by ta Coates, which I strongly recommend. Um, I thought that was really good, um, and it was a good thing to read now with everything that's going on. Um, uh, I was going to say that I, I have a problem with this question because I go through phases uh, where I switch through different genres and different authors, and I read obsessively, uh, you know, books of one author, and then I switch to something completely different. So sometimes it's uh, like half a year of just thrillers, and then it's uh, like urban fantasy or um, or then rom romance. Um, so some some of the authors that uh, I've uh, read a lot of um, in the last year or two was. Uh, Maggie Steve Otter and um, Lainey Taylor. Um, and as I have a, an 11 year old at home, uh, very often he just recommends bo books for me. Uh, so I'm just starting. Uh, I know it's very, very late, but uh, I'm just starting on Riordan right now. Uh, <laughs> So um, never too late, I guess. And and recently, I, I just had to check the, the the English name because he he recommended something for me in Polish, and uh, it's Fable Heaven uh, series. I haven't started that yet, but yeah, that's I guess that's on my list. I'm a big fan of Adam Silvera, who has written a couple scenes that I really wish I could write. Um, and I'm also a really big fan these days of um, Nonieka Ramos, who wrote The Disturbed Girls Dictionary and The Truth Is, which are both incredibly powerful, incredibly well-written, um, queer YA books by a Latina author who, God, I wish I could write like her when I grow up. Um, well, in the same vein, um, what have y'all been reading in lockdown to stay motivated and hopeful? Um, and if not reading, what have you been watching? What have you, what new hobbies do you have <laughs> um, since you have, uh, since we've all been at home for the past few months? 
I will actually say I'm generally a reader and I don't watch a lot of television and I don't know if it's just being locked in a home with my children for four months, but I started really obsessively watching TV shows and also watching TV shows that are not necessarily happy. I don't, that's not generally my jam. Um, so I watched all of Call the Midwife, um, which is pretty much an exercise in cry every hour. Um, but it's really, it, I really loved, I really loved Call the Midwife. I love the, the aspects of like female friendships and um, just, uh, not even female friendships, but I really, there's a part of like the historical aspect of it. And I really enjoyed that show. And now I'm watching the Babysitter's Club. So obviously I went like zero to 60 and I'm watching it without my children. I am unironically enjoying the Babysitter's Club by myself. I've been struggling a little bit with reading in lockdown. I read so many books, I think the first four to five weeks that we were in lockdown. And then after that, like my anxiety has just started to take over rampantly, but I have been listening to a ton of audiobooks. Um, so I listened to Gideon the Ninth. Um, I recently listened to um, the, the Life in Medieval Times of Kit Sweetly, which was the first um, contemporary that I had read in a while and I really liked it. It's about um, a girl who gets a summer job at medieval times, which since I'm originally from the north side of Chicago, I knew exactly what that was. And it's basically like a giant Disney castle meets tavern, if you can imagine it, um, where people go to eat. So I, I really liked that one. And it I haven't been locked down um, because I work for Rhode Island state government. So I've been very, 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 very busy. <laughs> but um, I have found that at night when I'm totally a happy boost. and I can't think, um, the only thing I want to do is watch West Wing reruns because it takes me back to a time when government seemed to work a little better, even when they didn't always get it right. So it sort of cheers me up. I'm getting really good at baking sourdough <laughs> and eating it. Now, I have to ask, did you name your sourdough starter? Yeah, COVID. I have seen that that's a thing. I have just seen <laughs> right. that people name their sourdough starters. So I was just asking. Uh, I, not creative for a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen Clint Eastwood. Oh, um, very good. And a couple other ones that were pretty funny. <laughs> so um, I, you know, uh, I also work for state government. I work for North Carolina state government as my day job. So I've been super busy. And so um, by the time that I close my work computer and then open my <laughs> home computer, um, my, I'm pretty brain dead. So um, trying to consume anything really um, has been a challenge, especially, and then I have three kids at home too that have been home um, since March. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I have watched um, a lot of uh, Chinese dramas. Um, I don't know why. I, my friends and I have gotten uh, into those recently. So I watched all 50 episodes of The Untamed in um, just a few days. Um, and then I've been watching some other uh, Chinese dramas. Um, and, and surprisingly, reading the um, subtitles has not been difficult. Um, but it, it felt like anything else beyond that has been a struggle. So another question, um, have you been writing more or less in lockdown? Yes. <laughs> I've been trying to, to write more, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like my um, focus is kind of shot a little bit and so I try to write in you know little spurts so even just 20 minutes here half an hour there uh, but I'm trying to get back um, into regular writing after you know having a period of uh, just anxiety caused uh, I don't know lack of creativity. <laughs> I've been actually I've been writing so I'm splitting my time between writing academic stuff and writing fiction, but I'm kind of, um, I kind of had to try to learn to, or relearn to read and write after I had my concussion. So I started writing fan fiction again, just for kind of for myself, because the world is already built. So it felt like an easy way to get back into something that I knew how to do. Um, so that I'm kind of like 
now starting to get ready to pick up on the, the YA novel that I was halfway through when I was injured. And then the other half of my brain is trying to pick back up on my PhD, which I had to pause as well. So I've been writing a lot. It's just not really shareable. <laughs> it's kind of just for me at this point. <laughs> Early into my reading, I feel like I wrote a lot in the first few weeks of lockdown, maybe like even up to the first six weeks. I'm in Seattle, so we've been doing this for a really long time here. Um, and then I sort of like hit a wall and couldn't write anymore. And I think it's part of like, partly because like I have such a lack of external inputs, which I never really realized how important like getting out and like seeing other things, like traveling a little ways, like just meeting with other people, like how important that was for me to find inspiration in that except that now that it's gone, I feel like my well of like creative energy is kind of dried up. Tom and I have been working on a middle grade novel and um, we've been working pretty steadily on it, but it feels like we're not making any progress on it at all to me. So <laughs> I don't know, I find that I have to really, um, like take some time to separate from work mode and and the world and then to get into a creative space and that's hard to do but once I get there it's really nice because there's nowhere else to go and nowhere else to be so if you can find your way to that creative space um, there's more time to do it uh, it's just a question of getting there Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I, I have, I've written a lot less. Um, I was editing some projects in, in January and February. And then um, when March had came around and I was done at doing all those edits, I was like, yeah, it's time to write. Let's start something new. And I just haven't. Um, it's just been a, a lot of, um, like I said, you know, at the end of the day, because my work has increased. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the end of the day and, and having everybody at home and not having a lot of like the external stimuli, like, like Julia said, and not being out, to, you know, I can go for a walk, but I've only can walk my neighborhood so many times. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so I'm really trying hard for July. Mm -hmm. Do Camp Nano, get some words in. <laughs> oh, I forgot about Camp Nano. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, I have to do an exam. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so right now July is Camp Nano, and I'm hoping to, to get at least a, a couple thousand words done. Um, so uh, again, if you guys have any questions that are here, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and what is um, next for all of y'all? Do you have anything coming up? Any books, other books coming out other than this wonderful anthology anything else i know julia has uh something upcoming yes um so i have another novel coming out in november um it's called ruin song it is a lesbian phantom of the opera retelling um yeah i'm really excited the cover is beautiful i failed to make a printout before this um and i haven't got ours yet but yeah it, i'm really excited for it it's a high fantasy phantom of the opera retelling um where music um, is magic and the primary character basically has to decide if she is going to follow in the evil queen's footsteps um, or if she's going to forge a new path for herself with the resistance. And you have a pre-order campaign? For I do, campaign. yes. I have some very beautiful pins, um, some very beautiful postcards, things like that. So yes, definitely check out the pre-order campaign and pre-order Rune Song if Lesbian Venom of the Opera sounds like your jam. Uh, I, I actually don't have anything, you know, ready, but uh, I have just taken out of hiding, I would say, uh, a project that I've been working on and off uh, for, I think, five years. So uh, it's, it's like 90% written. And I have taken the time to, to read through all three uh, versions of it, versions or draft of, drafts of it. Uh, then I decided that I have to rewrite it, of course. So, <laughs> so I, I just hope that this time it will be finished and it will see the light of day. 
I was in the middle of writing a book. It's about best friends who um, in their last year of high school end up having to move to separate states. And um, kind of the premise of it is the, the road tripping back and forth to see each other and how that distance takes like that. It's a friends to lovers, basically. Um, and I'm really excited to pick it back up once I am done with my exam. Cause it was like that, it was writing itself. So I was halfway through and I'm really excited because it, it would be my first full YA. Um, so hopefully once I have defended my prospectus, I'll get back to it. <laughs> okay, we have another question. Um, if you could write a crossover of any of your characters in short stuff or any of your other projects into a known media or universe, which would it be? Um, That's an amazing question. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's so hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. I just watched Unorthodox. Um, and I have some personal and professional uh, experience with the Hasidic community. And I think it would be sort of fascinating to write about some queer characters in the Hasidic community. I'd be afraid to, but I'd, I'd be very interested in it. There was a really good book written um, a few years ago. I just remember the cover. It was like a hand. It was beautiful. I'm not helpful at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was, uh, it's an interlude press book. Um, oh, okay. Flying Without they, a Net. Yes. I don't know if it's e. about Shaw. the Hasidic. Yeah, I, it may, may it's not be. It's not. It's orthodox. Okay, yeah. Um, Sorry, that cover stood out to me. It was such a beautiful cover. Mm -hmm. um, That's a hard question. I think probably I would, I would probably take my duology characters and see how they fared um, with like the Norse interpretation in Marvel. I think that would be really fun. Um, to like take kind of my impressions of like the Norse gods and like kind of mash them up with some of the Marvel ones. Um, yeah, I'm sure that would be a disaster from an IP perspective, but I think it would be fun. I think that I would be really, I tend to secretly and not so secretly devour dystopian fiction. So a part of me wants to say, I'd like to stick my characters somewhere dystopian. But I think that they'd all die in like five minutes. Um, but also, I think it'd be really exciting to do a crossover with Frankenstein, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I've always mm -hmm. really, really wanted to be able to do either retelling or um, kind of something that plays with those themes. So I might take, I'd have to figure out which one of my characters. I might take Tyler from Idlewild because he's some really interesting kind of chameleon qualities. And he's just a really interesting character, I say, like hidden strengths. So he might, I don't know. I don't know if I could stick him on a ship and have him tell a story or have him chase Frankenstein across the world. We'll see. <laughs> I have a problem fi finding anything for mine. The, the only thing that comes to mind is Gilmore Girls. Girls. <laughs> FT, what about you? Um, I was just thinking I would like to take Bridger from the rules duology because he, he always exists at this kind of low level panic state about like what's around the next quarter. Is there going to be Sasquatch or a unicorn or something? And just put him in just various situations. Um, you know, maybe I'll stick him with Julia's characters uh, <laughs> or, you know, um, put him in a, a Marvel movie or a zombie apocalypse and just see how he would fare. I think in in zombie apocalypse he'd probably die pretty quickly but um in everything else he's pretty resourceful and he's pretty uh um used to the weird things that happen um he might enjoy uh, joining percy jackson that's like more middle grade yeah. but I, I he might have fun in there he might he might yeah you could put him in the the girl with all the gifts zombies where they're sentient and teachable that would be interesting oh. Yeah, the same. I think he could handle a zombie on a yeah. like a level that I could not. <laughs> so, you know, so I think that he he would do. I think he would do okay in in a lot of different weird um, kind of fantasy situations, post apocalyptic situations. Yeah. Um, I don't think he would do well in a contemporary because he'd always be looking for like what's behind that you know what's behind the bookcase over there you know kind of thing. So. 
Um, well, I, we don't have any more questions in the chat right now, and we are getting close to the hour. Um, anything else that is coming up for y'all or anything that you want to promote other than your lovely anthology? Can we talk about your cover reveal? Yes. Um, I have a uh, high fantasy book coming out um, called In Deeper Waters. It'll be out uh, April 20th of next year. And it is pitched as the Gentleman's Guide to Vice and Virtue meets Pirates of the Caribbean. So um, kind of a crossover. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, kind of a crossover. And um, it just had its cover reveal. And like Julia, I don't have anything printed out. <laughs> um, but it just came, the cover was revealed um, last week. Yeah. And it's, it's a very beautiful, um, it's on my, on my website and it's on my Twitter and it's on my Instagram because I just put it everywhere because it's so pretty. Um, but it, it's really great uh it's a really great representation of the characters in the in the the swooniness um it's the most romantic thing i've ever written um of that novel so thank you for bringing that up <laughs> so um why don't you guys plug your social media where can everybody find you we are at never have i ever books.com Um, you can find me at Twitter um, at Jules underscore Chronicle or on my website, um, Julia-Ember.com. You can find me at Jude Sierra on Twitter and um, JudeSierra.com for my website. I am on Instagram, but it's, you have to request access just because I have, a, you know, multiple worlds happening. <laughs> Uh, I'm on uh, katefiero.com and uh, I'm Miss Kate Firo on uh, Instagram, but there's not a lot happening there now. I'm trying to do better. <laughs> and I am FT Lukens on Twitter and I'm FT Lukens on Instagram. Um, and on my Instagram, you will see a lovely picture of me holding this book up in my yard because that is the where I could go get a picture um, in my house. Um, so this is, we've been talking about short stuff. It's available now um, and you can order it through Malaprops. You can order it through the Interlude Press website. Uh, and it again has four very fun, romancy, summer-ish novel, uh, short stories um, that make up this anthology. So um, that is it for us. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, please follow the authors uh, on their social media and please um, order from indie presses and indie bookstores when you can. Thank you very much. Thanks to Malaprop Thank you. for hosting us. Malapro. I appreciate it. Thanks guys for coming. That was was awesome. I realized I have a very spazzy face on a camera and I was all excited when you guys were talking. So again, <laughs> you can order their books, short stuff through www.malaprops.com. There's a little search bar at the top, or you can also get it directly from their press in our loop. And we wanted to thank everybody for coming again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe, everyone. Everyone yeah, stay, stay safe. safe. And wear a mask. <laughs>